I say that just because I think it's good for religious people to know that there's somebody going to be looking out for their interests. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Jason Harris. I'm the senior pastor of Central Presbyterian Church located in the heart of New York City. And I'm joined today by my very good friend, Michael McConnell, who served as a federal judge for the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit from 2002 to 2009. And since 2009, he has served as a law professor and the director of the Stanford Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. Michael and I have gotten to know each other over the years, especially during the time that he and his wife, Mary, have spent in New York when he's done some visiting teaching at NYU School of Law. And so it's great to be with you, Michael. Thanks for making the time for us today. It's a, a pleasure to see you and talk to you, Jason. Uh, uh, we certainly have enjoyed our time at Central. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, I wish that uh, we were able to see each other in person right now, but uh, this will have to do. And uh, we're grateful for the technology that that makes all this. So I have been on the other side of the Zoom uh, during uh, your uh, services, so you don't see me, but I see you. <laughs> well, I'm glad that's the case. Well, uh, to kick things off, uh, Michael, uh, let's start with this. We, we've been living under stay-at-home orders for over two months now, and that's meant that churches, mosques, and temples have had to close their doors and move their services online rather than in person. And that's, as you know, what we've been doing at, at Central. And of course, we're all willing to, to do our part in order to help prevent the spread of this virus and to protect the health of ourselves and, and others and, and help flatten the curve so that we don't overwhelm the, the hospital system. But I think the big question that is on everyone's mind is, is how long this is going to go on, and what should uh, churches and mosques and temples and various religious communities around the country expect as, as we move forward? So I am a constitutional lawyer, so I'm going to talk about the law of this. That's by no means the only thing on your mind. I know you and other religious leaders have you know, tough uh, uh, questions about you know, what's prudent and what's uh, healthy for people and what sets a good uh, Christian witness uh, in, a, in a time uh, of emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Constitution is, uh, does, does have, always has, mm -hmm. uh, a, a vision of guaranteeing uh, the, the right of free exercise of religion and certainly uh, religious worship is at the part of that. Now, <clears throat> in times of pandemic and other emergencies, all constitutional rights, uh, you know, take a certain uh, backseat to the exigencies of the emergency, but um, not forever and not completely. And uh, uh, around the country, uh, federal courts are beginning to uh, issue decisions, many of them against uh, churches, but also increasingly in the last uh, week or two, um, recognizing uh, the right of churches under properly supervised circumstances, observing all appropriate health regulations uh, to uh, open for uh, various forms of uh, religious worship. So this past Friday, the Governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, extended the New York State on pause executive order for the city of New York, as well as some other regions that weren't quite ready to, to reopen. And that executive order states that non-essential businesses must remain closed and that non-essential gatherings of individuals of any size for any reason are canceled or postponed uh, until that executive order is lifted. And, and as examples of non-essential gatherings, the executive order states parties, celebrations, or other social events, but it's been implied that that uh, relates to worship services as well. But should there be a difference uh, in terms of how we think of a worship service compared to, let's say, a birthday party? How should we think about that from the standpoint of the law? 
Well, I think there should be because uh, the Constitution, you know, clearly protects uh, the free exercise of religion. It's one of our most highly protected constitutional rights. There are many other important things in life that uh, I hate to see shut down, but don't enjoy that kind of, of, of legal protection. And the, 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 the bedrock principle here is that the government may not impose more stringent regulations on religious activities than it does on comparable uh, non-religious or secular activities, uh, which would include em employment and parties and, and other things of that sort. Now, the devil is in the details, and the question is, you know, what is comparable? And mm -hmm. here, uh, I'm going to give you my opinion. It is an opinion backed up by several recent courts, uh, court decisions, but others disagree. But in, in my uh, professional opinion, uh, comparable in this case means comparable in public health risk. That is, it is not the government's proper uh, authority to decide whether religious worship services are essential or not. The First Amendment has decided that they are among the most protected of all activities. Um, that doesn't mean that churches can go off and do things that are, uh, that, are, that are more dangerous. So there may be aspects of the way religious worship is conducted that um, you know, present public health problems and can be regulated. I cannot imagine right now, you know, 2,000 people packed together uh, in a worship service, uh, you know, belting out the hymns and, and giving each other the, uh, you know, passing the, 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 the peace. It's, um, that would not work, but um, gatherings of, you know, certain numbers of 50 uh, is, a, is a number in many of the uh, state executive orders. Um, observing social distancing, which I think is possible in most houses of worship and other hygiene regulations. If the church services are no more dangerous than other things that are being, uh, other secular activities that are being permitted, uh, then the constitutional rights kick in uh, and the churches should be permitted to open on those uh, same uh, grounds. I'm, I'm, I assume that you as a pastor are thinking about how to um, you know, conduct church services under safe circumstances that I'd be curious to know what you're thinking. Right. And uh, I, I, I think it goes without saying, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, that of course we want to do everything we can to, to keep people safe and uh, to prevent the risk of exposure to others outside of our congregation as well. So we have uh, erred on the side of, of safety for all these many weeks and intend to uh, continue to do the same going forward. Uh, but, but as these stay-at-home orders are extended for uh, longer and longer periods of time, we, we are trying to figure out, well, what is the most prudent thing for us to do? Because uh, it doesn't seem like it would be good for the well-being of our congregation to remain isolated for so long because uh, there's unintended consequences that come from the stay-at-home orders. We might protect the physical health of some, uh, but then uh, their emotional, mental, or spiritual health uh, might suffer as a result. Uh, so we are trying to think through uh, what are wise and prudent ways for us to slowly reopen uh, our congregation uh, in ways that uh, we see businesses, secular businesses in the city, uh, gradually finding ways to, to reopen. Uh, you recently uh, wrote, uh, co-authored an opinion piece in the New York Times in, in which you said, well, if uh, liquor stores are essential, why isn't church? And uh, under the current uh, executive order, uh, there's a number of businesses that are considered essential, which makes sense, such as grocery stores and pharmacies and financial institutions. Uh, 
but uh, restaurants and bars uh, are also considered essential as long as they are providing food by takeout and delivery only. And uh, public parks and liquor stores are also considered essential. So uh, we, we found a way to uh, keep the liquor stores open by ensuring that people wear masks when they enter a store and they maintain uh, a distance of at least six feet from other customers. And so that at least begs the question, well, well, shouldn't churches be considered essential in that way if, if they follow the same safeguards? So how would you respond to that? So the, the thing that I think has been amiss in many of the states is that the governors and mayors have sometimes taken the attitude that uh, a certain degree of health risk is necessary for essential activities, but church, ah, you know, that doesn't matter. That's like that doesn't. That's of no consequence, and so we. So you can't meet at all. We won't. We'll reduce that risk to zero. Whereas we are recognizing uh, that it's perfect. That it's if enough. Uh, uh, for people to gather uh, for other purposes, I think that's I think that's wrong. I think it's uh, uh, I, I think it would be wrong even apart from the law. But I think that the, in, it, that it's uh, actually uh, unconstitutional. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a statement by the Department of Justice, oh, dated April 9th. Um, well, it's real short. I'll just read this portion to you. Mm -hmm. There is no pandemic exception for religious freedom protections. Mm -hmm. Although it is legal for the government to protect health and safety by limiting assemblies, including religious assemblies, government may not impose special restrictions on religious activity that does not apply to similar non-religious activity. Mm -hmm. And so I, the question has to be, well, what are the comparable risks? Not whether the governor thinks religious worship is valuable or not. Um, now, I don't know how this comes out. I'm not a public health expert. So um, there was a, a court decision in Illinois where the court said that the difference between a church service and a retail establishment is it in the church service you're sitting there for an entire hour in close proximity and whereas in the store you are you know any contact you have is just going to be fleeting and momentary and, and so forth well that might be right um again i'm not a public health expert i'd want to know what what the truth of the matter is but i could easily see that it, the opposite might be true that in a store, <clears throat> you're at the mercy of other people. They may or may not be wearing masks. They may or may not observe the social distance. People come into your space. Um, I've been to the grocery store. People come into your space. You don't know where they've been. You don't know who they are. Um, uh, they touch things in the store. Um, any number of risks are being taken. And it's in a very uncontrolled environment. Whereas I would think in a, in a uh, house of worship, that it would be possible uh, to be much more orderly about, the, about it, to make sure that social distancing is being observed, to make sure that things are being sanitized uh, uh, afterwards, uh, and that the risk, in fact, of a church service is, could very well be considerably lower uh, the risk of a uh, congested uh, retail establishment. It doesn't have to be lower to be allowed. It just has to be comparable because the constitutional law is that no more stringent requirements may be imposed on religious activity than comparable, and I think that means comparably risky uh, secular activities. So that raises uh, some specific questions for me. Uh, we've been told that uh, when a region like New York City is permitted to reopen and move into what the state is calling phase one, that will allow retail businesses uh, to open, uh, provided that uh, no more than 50% of 
maximum occupancy is permitted into the store at any one time. And then all, all uh, customers have to wear face masks and, and hand sanitizer has to be made available. And so in that scenario, that, that has me wondering, uh, even if we were to continue to film our services in advance uh, in order to provide them online on Sundays, uh, could we could we allow those who are in New York and who are willing to take the risk uh, to worship alongside us in person because that's more meaningful for them, uh, provided that they uh, maintain the social distance of six feet, provided that we have hand sanitizer available, provided that they wear face masks. Uh, we could even ask them to take their temperature before before they enter and to stay away if they have a temperature above a certain degree. Uh, and then in addition to that, we could also keep track of who attends any worship service so that if anyone were to become infected with the virus, it'd be very easy for us to do the necessary uh, tracing to encourage everyone who might've been exposed to, to self-quarantine. Uh, for us, that seems like perhaps a first step towards reopening. Uh, would you think that that's uh, a valid way to, to go under the law? Uh, how, how would you uh, respond to that potential scenario? You know, I think so. Again, with a, a, what I would want is for the responsible government officials to look at that and ask themselves, um, are those health restrictions that you're talking about uh, do, do they make attendance at the church service no riskier than other things we are already permitting for hardware stores and, and, and office environments and, and, and others? I think the answer to that should be yes, uh, but, um, but I'm quite confident that's the right question that should be asked. Now, I don't think you want to do that as a matter of self-help, which want to do is apply to the proper authorities, get an answer, and then at some point, if the authorities are, un are unreasonably intransigent, some a church may need to file suit, as is happening uh, in other places in the country. Now, <clears throat> I'm enough of a lawyer not to <laughs> advocate going to court very often, right. uh, but it might be necessary. And, the, and there have been, in the last two weeks, uh, a number of, you know, a small number, but still a number of uh, federal court decisions uh, uh, that allow churches to meet on the ground that the cities or states are already allowing comparably risky uh, secular activities to meet. Well, in light of that, let me let me ask you two other potential scenarios uh, just to get your opinion on them. Uh, this past weekend, the weather finally turned in New York City. We had beautiful weather, 75 degrees and sunny. And so Central Park was absolutely packed. Uh, people were maintaining a distance from other groups, although uh, people were sitting in groups with with family or friends. Uh, we noticed that uh, police officers uh, were walking through the park, but they were not issuing summons or, or arresting anyone uh, if they weren't wearing a face mask or if they were clustered too closely, but they were handing out uh, face masks. Uh, and, and that got me wondering, too, that if, uh, if public parks are considered essential and uh, are therefore open, uh, would a church be able to... Uh, meet out in the open in the park uh, and hold a service provided again that people uh, are following all necessary protocols or another scenario that uh, was recently proposed to me was the idea of well even if we had our services online which people could participate in electronically uh, could they wait in line outside of the church in the same way that people are lining up outside of Whole Foods and come into the church one by one uh, to receive communion, because obviously you can't receive communion, uh, you can't participate in the sacrament uh, over the internet. 
Uh, so these are some of the other scenarios that are, are starting to spin through my mind based on what I'm seeing happening on the ground in New York and other cases and trying to figure out how that might apply to, to uh, our experience as a church. So I think outdoor services are a great idea. I, uh, again, I don't, I'm not a public health expert, but everything that I read uh, is that, uh, uh, is that uh, the transmission is much less likely uh, outside and especially on a, on a sunny day. I had really expected there to be more uh, uh, sunrise uh, uh, Easter services uh, outdoors uh, and be, because it, it, it is so much easier to socially distance and the, and the health seems uh, pretty clear. There's a, uh, there was a, dis, a court decision just a, a day or two ago in North Carolina in which the governor's order um, prohibited meetings of more than 10 inside and required of churches that if they were going to meet inside with more than 10 people, that they had to prove it was impossible to move their services outside. So at least in North Carolina, it appears outdoor services must be uh, uh, must be a okay. I, New York, of course, presents its own difficulties for where you uh, where you meet. The administration of the sacraments is a very important matter, and uh, uh, it, for Presbyterians, I think it will be easier to find essentially risk free ways to administer the sacrament uh, that are much more complicated or difficult for Roman Catholics where uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the wine can't be uh, put in little plastic cups and the, the, uh, there, there's even some, for some Roman Catholics, the, uh, the receipt of the, of the bread needs to be on, right onto the tongue that isn't impossible, but it certainly presents more right. of a challenge. I could see people coming into your church and family groups one at a time and having the, the elements uh, available there and someone uh, giving the, uh, the appropriate blessing at a distance and, and, uh, and then uh, doing uh, the sanitation in between each group. And that, that looks, again, I don't want to pretend to be a public health expert, but that sure sounds to me like reducing the risk very close to zero. Right. Well, I, I during the height of the, the epidemic, uh, or I mean, during the height of the emergency, when people really didn't know what was going on, uh, I am told. I've been told by uh, uh, by some uh, church leaders that cities were not even allowing churches to be open for solitary prayer. Uh, that seems pretty extreme. Right. I agree. And uh, let, let me ask you this. In your New York Times opinion piece, uh, you laid out in summary the core principles of law that should guide our decision making. So perhaps you could just lay those out for us here. And, uh, and then to tack on to that, uh, it seems to me that uh, because of some initial pushback, more government officials now are unwilling to say anything too definitive about uh, worship services uh, because they, they don't want the, the blowback. But then it puts churches in an unusual position because uh, we're not being clearly told one way or another now uh, what we're supposed to do. I, I saw in the most recent uh, CDC guidelines, for example, uh, that the CDC stated that uh, churches cannot be held to a more strict standard than any other uh, comparable entity. Uh, but that's uh, not necessarily helpful when you're trying to figure out uh, where the lines uh, fall. Uh, so, so what are those uh, core principles uh, that should guide us during this time? And, and what should churches like ours do other than perhaps just 
asking permission for a particular idea. So I hope this isn't too general, but uh, in, in the first place, it is important to remember uh, that the civil government has considerable authority, that the separation of church and state does not give religious bodies immunity from public health regulations that are equally uh, applicable to everyone. And, and um, I haven't seen it as much in the last you know, week or so, but there were some pretty belligerent uh, pastors who uh, I think don't understand that um, the, the, the limits of, um, of the separation between church and state. So that's important. Yeah. Uh, to remember, the second principle is the one that we've been talking about most of uh, our conversation, which is the idea that religious um, uh, activity cannot be subjected to more stringent rules than comparable secular activity. The way the Supreme Court expresses this is that the government has the right to enforce what it calls neutral rules of general applicability, uh, but we judge the <coughs> sort of reasonability of a of a rule as applied to uh, one group by whether the government is equally applying it to others. And if there is, a, if it is okay to have for people to come into an office environment or a factory. Uh, for an eight-hour day and observing whatever social distancing is possible under those circumstances, uh, it makes you wonder, you know, how serious is the public health implication of coming into a church for one hour of worship, again, observing uh, properly, uh, proper regulations. That equality, that neutrality is the second a principle, mm -hmm. and the third is um, is what we call uh, reasonable accommodation. That uh, you know, some some people worry that oh, it would be favoritism toward uh, churches to allow them in you know, a special to, to cut special arrangements for them to uh, uh, to operate, uh, and this is a misunderstanding that the. The Supreme Court has made clear that it is permissible for the government to make special accommodations, even only for religion, um, if those accommodations are a reasonable, meaning that the uh, governmental purpose is achieved in, uh, to the greatest extent, but in, a, in the least restrictive uh, way possible. And so some going to be some contexts in which religious practice requires uh, an exception. Not, it's not going to be good enough just to say, you know, comparable secular uh, uh, rules. This is especially true for more sacramental uh, religious practices. But uh, my understanding is that in the city of New York, for example, the city has allowed <coughs> Roman Catholic priests uh, to administer last rites, and, and I think also the uh, uh, anointing of the sick uh, in hospitals on very carefully uh, uh, controlled circumstances, even when other people aren't being allowed uh, a visitation. This is, I think, um, not only constitutionally permissible, but extremely humane. Even if you're not a believer, um, you ought to be able to recognize the importance to the individuals involved of these uh, of these activities. To their, I hate to reduce it to a question of mental health, but mental health is part of it. Uh, but even the fact that they regard these matters as sacred ought to be enough to um, uh, to to you know permit some kinds of exceptions where uh, you know where the basic health requirements are being met and and through alternative safeguards. Yeah. So those are basically the rules. 
the separation is not absolute. Um, there's a requirement of, of neutrality of, uh, of treatment uh, and uh, reasonable accommodation. Right. So it seems, it seems clear when everyone is shut down and everyone needs to just stay at home in order to protect the health of others and, and therefore churches should follow suit as we have. Uh, the real debate begins when, when parts of, of our world and our economy reopen, uh, but it's unclear as to how the, the church should do so as well. And the more the the more we move into you know phase one and phase two and an opening of this and that, the less uh, defensible it's going to be for the government to insist that religious worship remain shut. And so, should we expect to get specific guidelines from the government now, or do you think they'll opt to remain silent on the whole, and therefore we need to either carve our own path or ask permission, what, what would be your advice to, to churches? So I, I really think that it's better for this to be done at a more local level. I, I think it's hard to make sensible rules to govern the country as a whole. So you mentioned the CDC, you know, their guidance was not very specific and not just for this, but for a, a lot of other things. But um, different places are different. Uh, I happen to be, you know, here in a, at, the, at the moment uh, uh, in a rural and remote part of southern Utah where there hasn't been a single case in a geographically very large county. Um, uh, there, there's a restaurant here that is, you know, open. People are actually eating inside. I haven't indulged, but um, New York City is. I'm, I'm sorry to say, is probably going to be one of the last places to open up because of the density of population and the reliance on the subway and uh, and bus system for getting around. It just presents difficulties that aren't. Um, aren't true uh, elsewhere. So, you know, what I would hope is that you do, you are entitled to clear guidance. This business about leaving everybody sort of the guess, I mean, man, in the early days, okay, but it's time for people to tell you what, what you can and can't do. They also ought to talk to you. And I don't mean you, Jason Harris, <laughs> but they ought to be talking to the religious community uh, and and sub communities that have different needs within the about what can be done and and to be sensible about it um, and I would expect the rules to be quite different in one place than another uh, already we've had a couple of states like Florida and Georgia have been opening up ahead of others so far um, thank Providence uh, uh, there's been no a spike in cases uh, that might be because the cause, we don't know how the cause and effect runs. It may be that those states that have less risk are the ones who open up faster. And so, you know, you, or it might be that the uh, that opening up in general is not quite as dangerous as, uh, as some of us uh, are, might think. I don't know. Um, but I do think that New York is going to be a tough case. Well, we've, we've seen that, and, and I, I expect that that will continue to be so. Uh, at the same time, you, you can see walking the streets that uh, people are growing tired of the restrictions and that uh, many individuals and businesses are getting creative about how to reopen. So all the... Uh, the bars on Second Avenue around the corner from my apartment, for example, have completely shifted the the layout of their their space. They've opened up their windows. They put their 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 bar literally in the window of uh, of their storefront uh, location and uh, are now selling food and drink uh, to those walking by as, as long as they're not uh, staying there to consume it. <laughs> so, uh, where is well, you're going to be a bit as clever? <laughs> what you're doing is even more important. Yeah, yeah. New Yorkers are uh, 
are not going to get held down. I don't think so. We'll we'll come up with creative solutions uh, to this and and uh, and follow suit. Uh, but uh, we're, we're very grateful for for your advice and and for your friendship and for all the wisdom that you have to impart to us. Uh, before well, we I was excited, by the way, to hear from you before just before we went on, and you were saying that. Uh, in fact, more people are attending remotely your services than by, by you know, many numbers, huge increase. And wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic brought with it a, a, re a revival? I, I'm not predicting that, but, you know, God works in uh, unusual ways. Well, that's absolutely right. He can he can use any situation and any circumstance to draw people to himself, and and we certainly pray that he might uh, work in that way during this time. And and yes, we we have noticed uh, a rather significant increase in the number of people who have been joining us online for our services. And I'm receiving a, a number of very encouraging emails uh, from people telling me that a friend or a family member who may have been distant from God or skeptical about Christianity has shown a, a new interest and is listening to the sermons and, and discussing them uh, together. And, and so these are all positive signs. And, and uh, like those bars on Second Avenue that are uh, getting creative and retooling their space, we as a church are definitely trying to be innovative and, and come up with new ideas and new ways to connect with people and to share the most important information that we believe there is to share, which is the message of Christ. So um, we- uh, I, I look forward to working in person. person with you next time I'm in New York. Absolutely. Well, I, I hope that happens sooner rather than later. And uh, before we sign off, uh, I did want to just ask you one, one final question. Uh, very recently in the last, uh, I guess it's probably been two weeks, uh, the announcement was made that uh, you'll be uh, co-leading the Facebook Oversight Board. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what uh, that entity will do and uh, what your primary responsibilities will be. So this is an independent board of 20. It will grow up to probably 40 uh, people around the country, I mean, around the world, with no uh, connection to Facebook, most of them being having distinguished uh, careers in one thing or another. We have a Nobel Peace Prize winner, a, a prime, former prime minister of Denmark, a number of a former uh, uh, a judge on the European Court of Human Rights, uh, long-term editor of the Manchester Guardian. So people from a variety of walks of life who are um, going to, who, who, and, and we are given binding authority to uh, overrule on Facebook's decisions. I mean, it's Facebook who's given this authority. They want an outside party to be able to review uh, their decisions taking down uh, content. This is going to be a very difficult um, and controversial uh, task, but uh, I do, you know, want your uh, listeners to know that there are some people on the board who uh, understand the importance of religious expression uh, over Facebook and the way social media has, of course, you know, for good and ill, uh, has uh, has opened up uh, communication, but. Uh, uh, it, really people have been around those who have uh, had some of the more uh, difficult uh, decisions foisted upon them in the past. Right. Well, I, I think it's uh, incredibly exciting to know that you'll be leading this board, and I know that it'll give great confidence uh, to Christians around the country and around the world uh, to, to know that someone like you, who uh, is so uh, steeped in uh, your knowledge and understanding of the Constitution and yet understands religious convictions is, is at the, the helm of this. So, uh, so thank you for taking on uh, this massive responsibility and we, we pray that, uh, that you'll be 
incredibly successful at it and that it'll be a great blessing to all people in terms of uh, freedom of speech. I can use those prayers, that's for sure. <laughs> well, well, we'll certainly send them your way. Thank you.